Why the borderline is not what you think. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. I've explained elsewhere that I'm a narcissistic psychopath, a hybrid between narcissist and psychopath, and what I do is provide you with understanding about my kind by presenting to you as our worldview, how we look at you, how we function, how we operate. As a consequence of my extended observation and immersion in activity with my kind, level of my intellect, and the awareness that has been granted to me by my particular revolved form of narcissism and psychopathy, I'm able to share all of this information with you for the furtherance of my legacy and, of course, your understanding. As part of this, I bust the myths about our kind. I plug the gaps in the knowledge where others don't fully understand it because they are not me. They're not of my kind. Where they are, they're unaware and therefore aren't able to articulate the way that my kind function. When it comes to personality disorders, the relevant guide being the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Criteria, and the American Psychiatric Association, of course, divides personality disorders into various cluster. We have cluster A, which includes paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder. Then we move on to the juicy cluster Bs, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and narcissistic personality disorder. And then, of course, cluster C, avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. There are other personality disorders outside of those clusters. And, of course, within cluster B, we have four. Antisocial personality disorder, which is what I, my psychopathy, have been diagnosed with, and narcissistic personality disorder. Histrionic, as mentioned, and, of course, borderline personality disorder. You'll notice that all four are clustered together, and with good reason because there are huge similarities between them. There are some differences, but huge similarities. Borderline personality disorder is something whereby many individuals recognise, as a consequence of diagnosis, that they are a borderline. There are others who aren't diagnosed, but declare themselves to be a borderline. I recall many years ago, in early discussions on my blog, that somebody actually stated that being with a borderline is worse than being with a narcissist, and then gave their own personal account of the hell that they had been through. The fact is, the term borderline is misleading, and in order to enable you to understand what precisely is meant by that, I'm going to provide you now with my video about the borderline in order to break down some myths to open up some further understanding about what actually is going on to enable you to get to the bottom of why borderline is used, why it's not actually what you think. For those of you that may have been diagnosed with that description, it actually may well provide you with some relief from the stigma that you may think is associated with such a diagnosis. In other instances, those of you that believe that you've been entangled with someone who was described as a borderline, you'll actually receive a very eye-opening explanation, which will probably accord with your own experience, but have been denied to you as a consequence of a label. We're going to embark upon this video, which I have segued with this opening explanation, to enable its reach to be extended, so that more people gain knowledge about what is really going on. The Borderline I'm often asked for my views about the borderline. Those that state that they are a borderline, those that have borderline personality disorder. What are they? What is their relationship with the narcissist? Do narcissists prefer borderlines? 
With regard to the borderline, I regard it as a misconceived description, and that the description of borderline ought to be removed because it essentially covers two groups and in a misleading manner. The first group is that it affords the title of borderline to individuals who are actually suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Victims of abuse, victims of trauma, whose behaviour manifests in a way which, as a consequence of this external stressor, causes a reduction in their emotional empathy for a period which is longer than the usual temporary reduction. An external stressor, such as fear, alcohol, drugs, loneliness, bereavement, stress, financial pressure, abuse and others, will cause, in an individual that has emotional empathy, a temporary reduction in that emotional empathy, resulting in behaviours which would be regarded as potentially disordered, certainly problematic, aggressive, chaotic, bewildering, confusing, up and down in nature. Usually, where there is a reduction in that emotional empathy, it tends to be, the, the consequent behaviour tends to be directed towards one person, invariably the protagonist, and is they who are on the receiving end of the unpleasant behaviour, the lashing out, the tirades, possibly physical violence, or an individual who is trying to help who gets caught up in, in essence in the crossfire. Sometimes, however, the individuals affected by the response of the individual with their reduced emotional empathy are more numerous. Usually, the incident is temporary in nature. It could just be a few minutes or a day or two, maybe a week. But as the external stressor is reduced and removed, for instance, a respite period is granted, Fatigue goes away with a good night's sleep, the effects of alcohol wear off, the emotional empathy returns, and those narcissistic traits which were being exhibited are kept within the framework of emotional empathy, and therefore the aberrant behaviour is removed. However, for some individuals, the sustained application of that abuse and that trauma results in a more elongated, extended period of the dampening down of their emotional empathy. It's not permanent. It will return, but it will take longer because the effect of the ongoing trauma or the consequences of the trauma are continuing to keep that emotional empathy down. So an individual who is repeatedly being abused to such a level may continue to cause a sustained reduction in their emotional empathy, resulting in aberrant behaviour. Or, even though the abuse has stopped, the consequences of it were so extreme that they continue, almost like an echo from the original event, to keep that emotional empathy down. And the individual is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which then is described as the behaviour of a borderline, and it isn't. This description is unhelpful, of course, to that victim. That description presents problems for that individual, and instead, their behaviour ought to be looked at as that associated with an individual who is experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Of course, not everybody who experiences PTSD lashes out at other people, but it is one manifestation of it. So that is the first group of those that are often described as borderlines when they are not. What about the second group? These are the narcissists. And invariably they are mid-range narcissists who claim that they experience empathy, that they have it, but the evidence suggests to the contrary. Notice that borderline personality disorder is placed in cluster B with narcissism. Many of the behaviours are similar with regard to the descriptions in the DSM. Furthermore, it's often said that a narcissist fears damage to self-esteem, 
whereas the borderline fears abandonment. Actually, those two aspects come from the same branch, the loss of control. Fearing that somebody is going to leave you threatens control. Fearing that somebody regards you in a poor light, because the narcissist does have good good, good self-esteem and doesn't want it damaged, amounts to a lack of control. The person that wants to get away from the individual because of their behaviour appears to be abandoning them. That threatens that individual's sense of control, resulting in the response to assert control over them. Telling a narcissist that they're not good enough threatens their control. Insulting them with regard to how they look or how they behave threatens the control. It threatens their high conceit of themselves, their high self-esteem, and therefore both instances are actually threats to control, and therefore the individuals are similar creatures, or indeed are the same creature. The idea is that most narcissists are male rather than female, and this is incorrect. My experience demonstrates a roughly 50-50 split. The reason, of course, that narcissism is seen as more prevalent in male is because of the more narrow view of narcissism of being the vain alpha male. He eats what he kills, doesn't care about anybody, thinks he's fantastic, he's always well-groomed, stares at himself in the mirror a lot. And as you all know, that is just one but, but a thin aspect of narcissism, and there are various different types. And therefore, it falls to be the case that more males would be viewed as narcissists with that narrow definition. But, for example, many of the mid-range narcissists are female. And, in my own experience, there is a roughly 50-50 split between the genders. The other aspect is this. Borderline is a gender-biased label. If you describe somebody as a narcissist, it's stigmatic. It's not praising somebody. Society has an image that women ordinarily ought to be nurturing, empathic, caring. And therefore, if their behaviours, which are those of a narcissist, were labelled as such, that would stigmatise. And instead, the term borderline came about in order to, in effect, almost call it narcissist light. The behaviours are those of the narcissist, but are not described as such to avoid the stigmatic effect. And you'll be aware that a much larger proportion of those diagnosed as borderline are women as opposed to men, bearing out this gender bias. If we look at the behaviours, interestingly, I've had many people say to me, actually, a borderline's worse than a narcissist. Well, actually, that is just a narcissist you've been dealing with and a particularly difficult one. You see, Many instances, you will get individuals who will say, I can't help what I do. It's my borderline in me. I have emotional empathy. I just can't help the way that I behave. That is blame-shifting, but a very subtle form of it. If you know that you are engaging in a behaviour which is causing difficulties for people and you do nothing about it, that denotes an absence of emotional empathy. I engage repeatedly in behaviour which causes problems for other people. I deem it as justified in order to get what I require. I know that people see it as difficult, but I don't care because my needs come first. I have no conscience, no guilt. I have no emotional empathy. Unaware narcissists also cause problems for people. Those which have no awareness at all don't even realise that they are causing a problem for other people, and if it's pointed out to them, you get the blank look. They're at a loss. Those are the lessers. Mid-range narcissists are capable of understanding that their behaviour can be described as problematic, but it is never ever their fault. They will blame something or someone else. You made me do it. It's because I'm tired. Well, if you weren't nasty to me, I wouldn't have to then not speak to you. It's always someone else's or something else's fault. What do the borderlines do? I can't help what I do. It's my borderline. 
They have an awareness that their problem, that their behavior is problematic, but it is blamed on something else. That is a very subtle form of blame shifting. If they had emotional empathy, they would know that they're causing problems and they would correct that behavior, but there is a failure to do so, which supports the fact that there can be no emotional empathy. An individual who has emotional empathy will not always behave as a saint. And where they engage in behavior which is problematic, and that is far less the case than it is when dealing with a narcissist, of course, they will rarely repeat it. They will take corrective, re corrective action. Their remorse and contrition is genuine. So where somebody who has emotional empathy, an empath or a normal, and even narcissistic individuals who have very low emotional empathy, first of all, their behavior is regulated in a different way because they see the world through a lens of emotional empathy, which governs their behaviors and interactions with other people. They don't need control. But moreover, it leads to them rarely engaging in habitual... It, re it means that they rarely engage in poor behavior, and they certainly don't engage in habitual bad behavior. Repeated poor behavior. Save, of course, where is the incident of an extended period of post-traumatic stress disorder. But even then, that will go away given time. And that draws the distinction between somebody who has emotional empathy and somebody who has not. Somebody who hasn't, the behavior keeps happening again and again and again. And no matter how aware they are of what they're doing, they don't accept responsibility for it. Because they don't accept responsibility, because they don't make any change, and they blame it on something else. And they may talk about how, I wish I could be different. I wish that things could be a different way. Well, do something about it. But it doesn't happen, because there's no emotional empathy to drive the behavior. The lashing out is a consequence of a threat to control. The claim that somebody's going to leave them. The fact that they're walking away from them is a threat to the control in the same way that it is experienced by a narcissist. And therefore, that is why a, a section, not all, but a section of individuals who are borderline are actually mid-range narcissists. And of course, if you point this out to them and explain, your behavior shows over a pattern, uh, over a period of time, demonstrates a pattern of repeated behaviors that demonstrate that you have no emotional empathy. You blame shift. You show a response to a threat to your control. You need to assert control. You express contrition, but then go and behave in the same way. You behave with an absence of emotional empathy. They will not accept it. They will not alter their ways. They will continue. And therefore, the borderline will protest. No, 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 it's not my fault. I just can't help being this way. It's the fact that I'm a borderline. It's my borderline that does this. I do have emotional empathy. Well, if you do, why aren't you exhibiting it? Oh, it's because I'm a borderline. No, that's blame shifting. And there will be doubtless those that will disagree with me with regard to this. But of course, what is happening, that's the narcissism. Demonstrating that they will not accept that they ought to be responsible for their behaviours. For my part, I know that people should say that I ought to take responsibility for my behaviors. I do. I know what I do. And I continue to do it because it serves me well. People say, you ought to change. You should know better. To which I say, I do know better. This is effective for me. I don't care about the others. And therefore, it is appropriate for me to do this. I don't care that the impact it has on other people. It is justified. It is necessary. It is appropriate for me to behave in that way. With the borderline, they are either individuals who are suffering the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is impacting upon their behavior, resulting in disordered uh, relationships for a period of time, engaging in behaviors which will be seen as inappropriate and abnormal for a period of time. But with the appropriate help and guidance, they will move away from that and their emotional empathy will return. And that is why, in some instances, it is declared that, in inverted commas, borderlines can be helped. Those are the ones with post-traumatic stress disorder. The ones where there is no progress being made, that there are years upon years upon years of the repeated behaviours, the 
rejection of accountability, the continued manipulative behavior, the protestations of I can't help it, it's not me, all of that is the behavior of a mid-range narcissist. Some of you listening to this will have been described as borderlines. Many of you will in fact be those that are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, as I've mentioned. There will be other individuals that have been entangled by somebody who is borderline, and then you will realize, actually, yes, what you say makes sense, HG. These individuals are actually narcissists. They exhibit the same range of behaviors, responses, manipulations, and absence of emotional empathy as the narcissist. That is why? Because they are one. And that is the distinction. I know that a particular psychiatric association has done away with the concept of the borderline, not recognizing it as something that ought to be a diagnosis. But my firm view in this matter is that there are those who are called borderlines and they're not. They're victims with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are others who are not borderlines. They are mid-range narcissists. But of course, they will never be able to accept that because their narcissism will not allow them to do so. Those are the distinctions. Now, what about the narcissist's preference for a borderline or the interaction? Well, quite simply, that is a case of when narcissists collide. And I have given examples of that in other videos. So where someone talks about a narcissist and a borderline and it being a chaotic relationship, it's actually some narc-on-narc -narc action. And that is what is behind it. It's as simple as that. Or you might have an instance of where it's a narcissist involved with an individual who is a genuine victim and their behavior towards the narcissist is as a consequence of the abuse occasioning uh, post-traumatic stress disorder causing a reduction in their emotional empathy and therefore they respond with aberrant behaviors towards the narcissist so that outwardly it looks like a chaotic relationship. The distinction is that that individual, once removed from the narcissist and with restorative assistance, will have their emotional empathy return and the behaviours will disappear because emotional empathy returns. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.